right. Yeah, thank you so much, Asia, for the invitation. And it's a great pleasure to be uh, virtually visiting uh, Bochum today. Um, so the title of my talk is uh, Deep Learning Under Resource Constraints. And actually, I kind of modified the title slightly to make it more precise, added via Bayesian inference. And um, hopefully, this will be, become clear uh, what this is meant by this. So I should say that um, I have no idea how many people are joining live. So um, if it's a tractable small number, I'm encouraging everyone to ask questions. If the questions become too many at some point, I might change that opinion uh, depending on, on demand. All right. Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, yeah. So what is this talk about? Um, it's essentially about deep learning, right? And we've all experienced that deep learning affects a large part of our society in basically every areas of our lives. We're encountering deep learning algorithms when we do Google search. We're, you know, we're already used to amazing uh, performance of computer vision algorithms, uh, of speech recognition. Uh, we've seen self-driving cars in some parts of the world already. So deep learning is essentially already everywhere and it's, it's hugely affecting our, our lives. But at the same time, deep learning has really become increasingly expensive, and there is actually an ongoing trend uh, that continues to do so. Right? So what this plot actually shows you is the typical network sizes of state-of-the-art natural language processing um, systems, um, starting from simple ResNet 50 up to GPT-2s, um, as, as encountered now, nowadays NLP systems. And I just want to point out here uh, to the fact that this is really exponential growth. Uh, so we are already in the multiple billions of uh, neural network parameters. Um, the largest networks that I'm aware of is actually in the hundreds of billions of parameters. And at these sizes, um, you know, suddenly energy considerations and also storage con considerations and also data considerations become uh, hugely important, right? I mean, so these networks really consume um, a huge number of um, um, you know, megabytes, um, terabytes. So there's a lot of electricity that's being consumed and, and there's no sign yet that this trend will ever stop, right? So at some point we'll face enormous challenges. And um, so this makes really this research question very important of how can we actually design architectures? How can we design deep learning model models that are more, more resource efficient and more energy efficient? Uh, and also, um, how can we actually use deep learning to solve our data storage problems? That's yet another issue, right? I mean, compression becomes obviously more and more important, in particular also as we are streaming more and more of our, of our content, like live videos through the internet. It's already nowadays 80% that's responsible for video streaming. So te technologies like video compression, for example, will also become increasingly important uh, in, in our um, everyday lives, right? So this has really motivated this big question for um, you know, data efficient machine learning, in particular deep learning approaches. And that's going to be what I'm going to talk about today. So in particular, I divided up this, this problem of more resource efficient deep learning algorithms along three major questions, um, each affecting a different kind of efficiency. Right? So when we talk about resource efficiency, we can think about at least three different dimensions. Um, first, there's clearly data efficiency. So um, this would be asking, you know, how can we actually design deep learning algorithms or models that can extract more information from fewer data, right? I mean, how can we, um, for example, train them on um, sparse sequential data that, that, you know, arrives every now and then, maybe data under distribution shift, um, where we never see a big data set to train our model on. So those are the, the questions that we want to um, address in, in terms of data efficiency. Um, but there's also storage efficiency, right? Um, and here the question is slightly different. So um, how can we use actually deep learning to, um, to uh, you know, not only compress models, in other words, to make them more parameter efficient, but also to compress data, right? Um, so can we maybe revolutionize the way how um, currently we uh, compress videos or compress images and, and as, as you'll see, I have some partial answers to these questions also. And the final aspect of um, resource efficiency essentially affects runtimes, right? So what kind of training algorithms do we actually need in order to satisfy the goals in, in you know, question one and two um, that are, you know, what, which algorithms are best suited for, uh, for these tasks and, and how can we make them faster, right? So this is gonna be 
addressed in the last part of the talk. And I'm sure there are many experts already here in this talk, but you know, just to get everybody on the same uh, ground. So, you know, this talk is primarily about deep learning. So let me at least spend one slide on neural networks. So what is actually an artificial neural network? So you can think of that as a, you know, processing machine that actually takes some very high dimensional input, such as um, an, an image represented by bare pixel values. And this gets then fed into the network. And what you see here in the middle is, you know, a collection of many layers and many artificial neurons, right? And so these layers are essentially processing the image layer by layer, doing certain mathematical operations and transforming the image into a more and more convenient mathematical shape until you arrive at the very end of the final layer in which you want to typically make a prediction, right? If you want to do, for example, image classification. So the output of that network would be a, um, a one-hot vector, so a vector that has only a single one and a lot of zeros over, for example, different classes. So here you see that the unit that is responsible for the prediction horse is being activated while all the other units are outputting zero. Right? So this is the level of understanding of, of neural networks that we need in this talk. However, I'm also drawing on this um, important area of latent variable model. So what, are, what is actually a latent variable model? And in particular, what is a deep latent variable model? So one simple way of thinking about deep latent variable models that we'll use a lot of in this talk are essentially neural networks, which are in some sense flipped upside down. So in, in contrast to the previous slide, where we started with a extremely high dimensional object, like an image, and we applied many, many neural network transformation to finally arrive at a low dimensional output, such as a prediction over finitely many different class labels. So now we actually want to generate highly structured objects such as images. So those are now becoming our outputs. And the inputs are low dimensional random variables or noise variables that generate these outputs, right? So we're going now typically from low dimensions up to high dimensions. And the input of that network is oftentimes called a latent variable. Latent because it can be thought of as some sort of best explanation of the image that we want to generate. And it's latent because it's not directly observed, right? So we have to kind of reason about what Z is such that when we push Z through that network, we generate a particular image of interest. So why are these deep latent variable models actually interesting? Um, you know, they can be used with different goals in mind. Uh, so first one is data generation, right? So we've, oftentimes we want to be able to synthesize voices, you know, language, maybe images for, you know, um, creativity purposes or super resolution, you know, increasing the resolution of an image or to generate images or video. And, and we'll see examples of that later in this talk. Sometimes the focus is slightly different where we don't actually care so much about generation, but rather about learning representations of these very high dimensional objects, right? And that can be used for unsupervised learning, for semi-supervised learning, where we kind of have a lot of unlabeled data and few labeled examples, or transfer learning, for example. And a slightly less usual or less common aspect of latent variable modeling is that of compression, you know, where we really want to train these models on uh, large data sets of images or videos to ultimately use them for learning better, better um, data compression models. And we'll learn a lot about that in, in this talk. So as I announced, along these three different axes of, of data efficiency, uh, of um, you know, resources efficiency, um, you know, data efficiency, storage efficiency, and runtime, I'll first talk about data efficiency. And in particular, what I primarily focus on here are high dimensional sparse and sequential data. And you'll understand in a moment why it might be important to um, really have efficient algorithms to train models on that. And I want to use this also as an opportunity to teach you a little bit about um, latent variable models a little bit more because we need some more background. And um, instead of directly diving into the neural network world, let me actually remind you of an important classical latent variable model which is called the Kalman filter. And this is actually a pretty old model that had its origins already in the 1960s. And the original purpose of this model was to actually denoise um, you know, time series, in particular tracking the location of objects such as rockets, right? So let's actually stick to that original example. 
and assume that we're tracing a rocket in the sky, right, or an airplane. And instead of observing an actual smooth trajectory, we're observing these kind of noisy um, observations. Right? So though these green dots here are noisy versions of that rocket's true location history. And let's call them xt. Um, x is the location, and t is the associated time index. So what we really want to do is we want to be able to trace that rocket. And so we want to really infer the underlying true locations, which are not affected by the noise, that are actually lying on that smooth curve. <clears throat> so in other words, we're going from green to the observations, and we want to infer the purple dots um, or um, violet dots here, which are the true locations. And those are our latent variables, and we call them zt. Now, these kinds of problems are very conveniently handled in that language of what's called probabilistic graphical models, which are you know, nothing but a convenient way of representing um, complicated probability distributions and formulating models. And they're actually very intuitive. So, um, so what you see here are there's a sequence of x's. Those are our rocket, rocket locations, x1 through xt. And there's this sequence of hidden true rocket location, z1 through zt, which we don't know. So those are the white nodes. And the shaded nodes, they, you know, they indicate the observed data. Right? And then you see there are arrows going from white nodes to shaded nodes. So this is like the um, statistical dependency of the noisy observation given the true location. And you also see arrows going from the zt to zt minus 1. So this essentially expresses a statistical dependency in time in these latent variables. So it tells you in particular that zt is strongly informative, informative about zt plus 1, the next true location. And, then, and this is actually a strong prior assumption that we built into the model. And this is what makes the approach so data efficient. right? So we're making a very strong assumption about an underlying smooth process that caused the noisy process, right? the noisy locations. Right? You also see that this graphical model reveals that zt are the underlying causes, in some sense, of the noisy observations xt. So once now the difference to deep probabilistic modeling, it's actually only a tiny step from there, namely deep probabilistic modeling combines probabilistic modeling with deep learning. Right? So the only addition here is that neural network elements are going to be building blocks in these uh, so-called probabilistic graphical models. And you'll see examples of that in a moment. So I want to get to an interesting example of combining these kinds of deep probabilistic, uh, probabilistic models with deep learning architectures, or in particular neural learning architectures, from the domain of natural language processing. And to better explain this, I want to give you some background of what's called a neural word embedding model. So I'm sure many of you have already heard about word embeddings. So those are popular models from natural language processing which automatically learn the meaning of abstract words based on large quantities of digitized text. Right? So what you oftentimes see are these kind of word clouds here, where every point corresponds to a word, and nearby points correspond to words that have similar semantic meaning. So the input of these models are just unstructured collections of text, and the output are these word vectors or points um, that can be understood at, as, as latent compressed representations of the semantics of individual words. Right? And schematically here, you can actually think of them as probabilistic graphical models, where you, know, you start from these um, latent word embedding, model, word embedding clouds that I'm highlighting here, and you do some sort of nonlinear transformation, and ultimately you, you get statistics that represent your, your underlying text corpora. So what we did here a couple of years back with my postdoc Robert Bamler. Um, we actually looked at word embeddings um, and we generalized word embeddings to a time series model in the following sense. So let's assume you are a historian and you want to understand the evolution of language over time. So you have books written in the year 1800 until you know books written in, in the year 2008. So you divide up your books into different years. And you want to essentially learn a word embedding model corresponding to every single individual year. Now, if you did that naively, you wouldn't have enough data to learn really good word embeddings in individual years, right? So these vocabularies are very large, and your observations are very sparse. You might not even observe every word in every year. 
And to kind of gain more data efficiency, you're actually tying them together. And the way you tie them together is actually pretty similar in this talent filtering sense that I talked about before. Just think of these word embeddings as noisy observations. And you're essentially learning, you're trying to learn a smooth trajectory of them as a function of time. Now, importantly, these word meanings may change, right? I mean, word is a dynamic, you know, language is a dynamic process. It changes, you know, words change their meanings. And so you want to really smoothen out these word trajectories using ideas from Kalman filtering. So this is a very good example of combining probabilistic modeling with um, neural representation learning. So I'm actually skipping a lot of the details here, but this is like a final result. Um, so what you can do with these trained models are kind of interesting um, plots of the dynamics of words as they, and movies of how words change their meaning over time. So unfortunately this um, video stopped. So let me play it again, actually. Uh, sorry. Let's see. Yeah. So what you see here are the years 1935 to 40, and you highlight the word broadcast. So broadcast is an interesting example because it's a word that really dramatically changed its semantics, ranging from um, its origin in agriculture towards the modern meaning of the word broadcast in the context of um, media technologies and broadcasting. And you really see this uh, semantic evolution happening in the 1930s. Um, you know, the broadcast word moves from a very different original position in semantic space into the area that's nowadays associated with its modern meaning. Um, in other words, being surrounded by words such as radio, press, and, and lecture, and similar words. Now, interestingly, you can, you know, this was just one cherry-picked example, but you can do a very systematic analysis. You can actually query the trained algorithm about, you know, among my huge vocabulary, what are actually the 10 words that changed their semantic the most in the last 150 years? And then, like, a list like this pops up. Um, let's actually look at one particular example, maybe the example number eight corresponding to the word peer. So how do you read these plots? Um, so first of all, on the um, x-axis, you see the dates ranging from 1850 to 2000. And on the y-axis, you see the similarity of certain other words to the word peer, right? And in particular, you always see a group of words that were very similar in semantics to the word peer in the past. Those are the red words, and those kind of move away from the modern meaning. Um, and other words, which are the blue words, they kind of were distant in the past and now became the nearest neighbors later in the present. Right? So the word peer, you see examples like nobleman, lawyer, knight. Those are um, you know, representative of the old meaning of the word peer. Think of the house of peers in, in Great Britain. right? So those are kind of essentially indicating nobility, whereas nowadays a peer is somebody of equal standing to use, which is almost the opposite. right? And these kind of trace these um, um, semantic evolutions simultaneously for all words in your, in your vocabulary. So why is this actually a good example of resource efficient learning? Um, so it turns out that prior assumptions in these models were very important. Um, without a strong prior, the signal essentially gets lost in the noise. And we actually only want to filter out significant semantic changes um, based on sharing statistical strength, sharing prior knowledge across the time domain. So for example, if you looked at the word cloud in the year, um, you know, I think this is 1998, um, and you looked at differences to the word cloud in the year 1999, so just one year later, and you connected all the errors of the words that changed the semantics, if you did it naively, you would get a dense plot, right? All the words change all the time. Um, and this is clearly a fact of not enough data, right? So this is not very interpretable. When you apply our Kalman filtering approach and the approach where everything is trained jointly end to end, you get a much sparser plot and really only the significant words change their semantics. So this is a good example of data efficient learning. <clears throat> okay, so in order to move on, I need a little bit of an excursion into an important class of models that I do a lot of research on, which are called variational autoencoders. So what are these famous variational autoencoders actually? So essentially, there are simple generative processes of, of high dimensional data, such as images. Right? And you've seen a similar plot before. You have a, um, a neural network essentially turned upside down. You insert some low dimensional noise vector. And the output of that work vector is a high dimensional structured object, such as an image. 
So the graphical model that corresponds to variational autoencoders is illustrated here in the middle of the slide. So you see it's just a simple latent variable model with a single latent variable z, which is the cause of your um, observed data x. And it's characterized by certain neural network parameters theta. So the question that you might ask is, you know, well, this is nice, but how do I actually train these models? I'm only used to training supervised neural networks. How can I train a neural network going from z to x when I don't know z? Right? Um, so this is, in fact, actually some sort of chicken and egg problem, if you think about it. Um, so the problem is, how can, we, how can we actually learn theta if we don't know z? Um, so here's the thing, right? I mean, if you knew z, if you knew the underlying latent variable of x, you can simply train theta in a supervised fashion, right? So then you have a z and x pair, and you just train your neural network. However, you don't know, you don't know z, um, but you can actually infer z. You can kind of optimize for the optimal z given a trained neural network theta. Right? And we'll actually learn about that. That relates to Bayesian inference and variational inference in particular. But how can you do that now jointly? Well, the trick is simply you can do it alternatively. Right? You do an update on z that allows you to do an update on theta. And then with the new configuration of the network, you again, um, you know, you can do a gradient step on theta. It gives you a new z. And this is called the EM algorithm that allows you to train these models. Now, the problem that even though this works, it's actually a very slow algorithm. And for this reason, the real innovation of variational autoencoders relied on a new pre training paradigm called amortized variational inference. And so what is this training paradigm? Um, it essentially amounts to a more efficient use um, or a more efficient training idea where we use a second neural network to automatically predict the optimized latent variable z given a data point x. So now you have not only the network going from z to x on the left-hand side, but you also have another network, theta, oh, sorry, phi, going from x to z that essentially takes your image as an input and predicts a latent variable or noise vector z. Now, these two networks are trained jointly. Um, you know, they're sometimes called the decoder and the encoder. And um, the way they're being jointly trained is called uh, variational inference, in particular, amortized variational inference. And this is where variational autoencoders um, got their name from. Now, why are they called autoencoders? They're called autoencoders essentially because you can go from the horse image to the noise vector and back to the horse image, right? So you kind of um, reduce the dimensionality and then you expand the dimensionality again. So this gives you some sort of closed loop, which is what autoencoders typically do. Okay. So what else can you do with these variational autoencoders and how do they actually relate to data efficiency still, right? Um, in particular, they can be actually used to not only model static data, but they can also be used to model dynamics. So this is a paper that we published a couple of years ago, which is called Disentangled Sequential Autoencoders, where the goal was to actually not to generate static images, but rather to generate video. And moreover, we also wanted to disentangle static content from dynamics. So the, there were two applications that we had in mind here. First, um, one was video prediction. So given the beginning of a video, predict all the future evolution. But we also wanted to learn a very compact representation of the video, which will become clear in a moment. So what these three different video sequences show you is this kind of partial control that our model gained us when we, uh, in, in generating and learning representations of these videos. So on the left-hand side, you see, um, you know, those are all samples of this model trained on little cartoon video clips of these, um, you know, characters coming from computer games. So the left-hand side shows you just randomly generated samples. You see kind of differently looking um, figures walking essentially randomly. The middle one shows you the same content, the same shape, but different dynamics. And the right-hand side allowed you to, to generate actually videos that had the same dynamics, but different shape. So I'll have to shift my video a little bit here because the graphical model that was actually responsible for it was this one here. So first of all, you see that this very much looks like the generative process of a variational autoencoder. So we have um, latent variables that um, you know, induce errors going from you know, white nodes into, into observed shaded nodes. Um, it looks a little bit like the Kalman filter again because we have this underlying sequence Z1 through ZT with errors going into the data sequence. Now, the difference is that this is all nonlinear. So all these transformations involve neural networks. 
But in addition to that, we also have this global variable f here that captures everything that's static in the video, right? So that f is the shape latent variable, and that's really affecting every single frame, whereas the z latent variables are essentially responsible for encoding um, the dynamic process. Okay. So interestingly, this time model, you know, we actually, you know, this work actually emerged when I was still at Disney Research, and we were thinking about applications. We, we actually found out that this is actually a very compelling model for video compression, right? So why is it so compelling? It's compelling because it's trying to factor out everything that's static in the video from everything that changes, that changes over time. And in particular for simple videos, this is actually a very reasonable modeling assumption. So what you see here are videos of a um, robot arm pushing objects around. And what you also see is that most of the objects are actually not moving, right? So the um, pixels that change from frame to frame are actually, again, very sparse. And in some sense, this is related to these um, dynamic word embeddings, which also have sparse changes over time. So now what you see here left is the ground truth video. On the right-hand side is our reconstruction video. Um, you know, this is not very scientific because I was not really showing you the actual compression performance metrics, but, um, but you can believe me that they're actually better already at low resolution videos. We're having kind of, um, we're still working on scaling them up to full resolution, which is a big challenge. Um, but, but those architectures are generally very promising for compression. Okay. So this is actually already the transition to the next topic, right? So, so far we talked about, um, you know, sparse um, temporal observations and um, how to exploit probabilistic models in, in particular time series models for more data efficiency. The next topic is about storage efficiency, right? So in other words, um, compression, how can we use these variational inference paradigms and deep probabilistic models to um, come up with better models for, for data compression and model compression? Okay, so this is actually a good moment to ask questions if there are any. Um, don't know if you were actually allowed to turn on your volume or um, if there are no questions, I can also take questions at the end of the talk. There's, there should be plenty of time. Okay, so then let's maybe for now move on and talk about storage efficiency. And again, for really talking about variational inference and their use cases for compression, I feel I need to provide a little bit more mathematical background. So everything so far was in terms of graphical models and pictures. Now I need to show a couple of formulas also. So what really is a probabilistic model? Probabilistic model is actually a joint distribution over data X and latent variable Z. Um, actually in this slide, I called them theta. So um, apologies for that, don't feel um, distracted. So theta are the latent variables. And this joint model P of X comma theta decomposes into what's called a likelihood P of X given theta and a prior P of theta. We're usually interested in the posterior distribution. In other words, the distribution over latent variables theta given observations X, P of theta given X. And according to the chain rule of probability or base rule also, this is given by the following formula on the, on the bottom left. Um, the posterior is given by essentially the joint distribution but normalized over all possible values of latent variables. Right? So the, the difference between the joint and the posterior is really this normalization integral over all possible values that the latent variables can take, right? because this ultimately has to be a normalized probability distribution. So this is actually the part that makes Bayesian inference hard, because many models have millions, if not billions, of parameters. So computing these integrals is actually intractable, and therefore we have to think about approximation tools. But before we even get there, in case you've never seen that before, here's a typical example of what happens in Bayesian inference. So let's assume you work with all Gaussian distributions. Um, you could formulate a prior as a very broad Gaussian distribution, you know, the blue dashed curve that has a lot of uncertainty about the true model parameters that you want to work with. Then you make an observation and that induces the likelihood. This is this green bell-shaped curve. And then finally, the posterior distribution is actually the combination of both, right? It's proportional to the product of the likelihood times the prior, but normalized to one. And this gives you the, 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 the red bell curve. When you see that, it's kind of some sort of interpolation between the prior and the data term. Okay. Um, yeah, so the problem of 
Bayesian inference is that this posterior in general is very hard to compute. It's actually almost always attractable to compute these posterior normalization constants. And the idea here is to use approximation tools um, and in particular to approximate that complicated posterior with a simpler distribution. So this is called what's called variational inference. And again, that relates to these aforementioned variational order decoders. So the picture that you should have in mind here is as follows. Um, we draw the posterior in this example as a one-dimensional bimodal distribution, just to highlight that it, in general, it might be something more complicated. And we approximate it with a simpler class of distribution. And in this example, it's a Gaussian distribution, like a unimodal Gaussian distribution, um, which has just a mean and a variance that you can tune. And those are exactly what we call variational parameters. We sometimes like to call them lambda, that you tune to adjust your approximate posterior Q to your true posterior P of Z given X. And the right metric to do that is actually called kalpa leipa divergence, which is an information theoretical distance measure between distributions, right? By minimizing KL divergence between Q and P, you're, um, you're, you're kind of mapping the Bayesian inference problem to an optimization problem that you can very efficiently solve using, for example, stochastic gradient descent. Okay. So let's actually take a slightly closer look at this, what's called the variational lower bound, or sometimes also called elbow. Um, so this is the objective function that variational inference truly optimizes. Right? So first of all, it's called L of lambda. Lambda are the aforementioned variational tuning parameters. So think of a mean and a variance of a Gaussian distribution. And the objective function is actually given in terms of expectations under Q of Z. So let's look at these two terms a little bit more closely. The first term is the expectation under Q, of the, under the variational distribution Q, of the log likelihood, P of X given, given Z. Whereas the second term is the KL divergence between the variational distribution Q and your prior P of Z. And also note that there's a prefactor beta, which is usually set to be one. Um, and, and we'll actually learn about shortly what happens if you, if you choose different values of beta. So those two terms are frequently given two different names. The first one is called a distortion, and the second term is called a rate for the following reasons. Um, what do these two different terms do? The distortion essentially wants to place probability mass of Q such as to explain the data as well as possible. So let's imagine a world with, without rate. So let's actually set beta to zero such that there's only the distortion term. So which variational distribution among all possible distributions would we actually choose in order to maximize the rate? So it turns out that you would actually pick a delta distribution and place all of its probability mass on to maximize the likelihood. Right? So this is another way of doing maximum likelihood estimation. So you also see that dramatically underestimates the variance of the true posterior. So what is then the meaning of the rate? Um, there's actually an interesting connection to compression, uh, namely the rate measures the, essentially the excess bits that you need in order to encode your data under your, when you use your prior for entropy coding, and we'll, we'll, get to there. we'll get there in a moment. But the other function of that rate term is to regularize your, your learned objective function. It turns out that if you're simultaneously minimizing or um, you know, rate and distortion together, then you actually get a better matching between your variational distribution and your true posterior, right? So these two different terms conspire that you can really use your learned variational Q as a proxy to your true posterior, right? So this is what happens if you choose beta to be one, which is what um, you know, Bayesian inference tells you to do when you, when you take it seriously. <clears throat> okay. So how does now this evidence lower bound and variational inference relate to data compression? Um, it turns out that you can use these trained variational autoencoder models for data compression, and typically this amounts to a three-step procedure. First, you know, you're given the trained variational autoencoder model, and you're given a data point X that you want to compress, for example, an image. So what do you do? What, how do you use this VAE? The first step is to actually use X and learn the optimal latent representation Z using your variational distribution Q. <laughs> and typically what you do there is you're using the most likely latent code Z that is the best explanation of your data point X. So now you have found a latent representation X, which is typically of lower, dim of lower dimension. So now you can go to step two, 
um, when you actually want to do compression, you also have to think about rounding and entropy coding, right? Because real valued numbers have infinitely many digits, so this is not useful, right? In, in compression, you want to work with finite precision. So you need to quantize your latent representation, right? So then you go from Z to Z star, you know? Typically, you round to a given number of integers um, after um, like a given number of decimal places, um, which is highlighted on the right-hand side. And once you've found your rounded latent representation, then you entropy code it. You do lossless compression on top of your loss, already lossy compression procedure to further remove redundancies in your data distribution. And lossy, lossless compression typically requires a density estimator, right? Because you need to a model that assigns short codes to frequent data points and rare and longer codes to rare data points. So you need a density model, and you typically use the prior P of Z for that for that um, entropy coding step. Okay, so this is actually a very powerful approach, and there's been a lot of work. Well, it's in the last two years, in particular, on, on compression. Um, you know, this can be actually used both for data compression. Uh, and also for model compression. So a lot of people care about, for example, pruning the parameters of neural networks using these Bayesian inference techniques, um, but they can also be used for competitive image compression. And, and I'll, I'll show you examples in a moment. So here you see actually, um, you know, the typical VAE architecture that you showed before on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you see this word embedding model that could be potentially also compressed using this variational inference approach to compression. Now, the point is that all of these compression methods, if you paid close attention to, they're not really using the Bayesian posterior uncertainty. They're only using the most likely latent code Z in order to achieve this compression. So in some sense, you're throwing away some potentially valuable information. And therefore, we actually ask the question, you know, taking posterior uncertainties into account, can you actually arrive at a better compression procedure? And the answer is yes. And it turns out that we as humans, we actually very intuitively do that all the time. To kind of give you an example, um, you know, if you ask me or somebody else, what's actually the population of Rome? You know, somebody might look up on Wikipedia and, you know, the answer on April 30th, 2018, the population of Rome was 2,800,700, uh, you know, whatever, right? An, an exact number taking all of the exact population into account. However, if you ask a historian, you know, what is actually the population of Rome in the year 500 AD? most likely you get an answer like, you know, 100,000, right? And of course, this is not wrong, right? It's only reflecting our uncertainty. It's already including our belief under uncertainty into that number. Somehow we have a good intuition that adding more digits to that would not make the answer more meaningful, right? We just don't know. And also it's a very nice round number. It's very compact. In other words, it's a much more compressed representation of the population of Rome that optimally factors in our, our beliefs about uncertainty into that compression. Now the question is, can we do something similar for images such that you know, when an image is very blurry, we're not wasting too many digits on it, whereas if an image is very sharp, we might want to allocate more bits to that image. Right? So that's the idea. OK, and actually, this is a very recent paper that we just got uh, accepted at ICML, which essentially does this. Um, let me first contrast this a little bit to previous approaches on compression first. So compression is actually intrinsically related to probabilistic modeling, as we've already heard. So the idea is always um, you don't have to transmit what you can already predict, right? So this is the entire philosophy about compression. So in other words, when you have a better generative model of your data, this automatically leads to better compression performance, right? And it ultimately leads to the fact that um, the minimal bit rate that you need in order to compress data has something to do with your, with your data entropy. Um, a classical example of compression, in particular lossless compression, is that of arithmetic coding. And I um, actually want to spend a few more minutes on that because it's important to understand the approach of our ICML paper. So think about um, encoding the outcome of a of, an, uh, of, a, um, of rolling a 10-sided dice, right? Um, let's assume you have events 0 to 10, and you, you're observing an outcome, and now you want to compress that message that's associated with that outcome. So what do you do in arithmetic coding? Um, well, first of all, you work with what's called a cumulative probability distribution to map that histogram onto the real-valued integral from 0 to 1. And actually, for discrete outcomes, there are two different CDFs. There is an upper CDF that takes the probability mass of the actual event into account. And there's a lower CDF that kind of 
counts all the probability mass up to that event, right? So now there are two steps. So what do you do in arithmetic coding? You're, let's, assu let's assume you observe seven as an outcome. We're actually looking up that corresponding interval between the upper and lower confidence bound of our CDF. And that actually leads to an interval, a subinterval of the interval zero and one. And within the subinterval of the interval zero and one, we're picking um, a binary representation that is as short as possible, but still within this interval. Right? So this example, the fraction of seven or eight turns out to be in this integral. And the shortest binary representation of that would be 0 0.111. Right? So this is now our compressed representation of the outcome seven. Okay. So can we do something similar for, okay, so hold on. Um, so, so we want to do something very similar now to um, data compression, in particular to lossy compression, and it turns out to be not straightforward. In a particular, as I said earlier, we, we want to not only transmit what we can already predict, but we also want to transmit what we are not sure about. Right? This amounts to this idea that I've highlighted before with the population of Rome at different times. And for that, we want to use Bayesian posterior uncertainties. So how does that work? So, Naively, the first thing being inspired by arithmetic coding, we could do something very similar. Um, we could, for example, we could look at, at a continuous data distribution illustrated now by this continuous line here, this Gaussian bell shape. And let's see if we can just encode an outcome from that distribution in pretty much the same way as we did in arithmetic coding. So it turns out, yeah, first of all, we need a CDF, a cumulated distribution function. And let's assume we make an observation like this number. We look up its value on the interval zero and one. And with probability one, we realize that this is actually not a rational number, right? In general, this is a real valued number and a real valued number has infinitely many digits. In other words, there's no way that this saves us any bits, right? This is a dense long number that takes as much space to compress as the original outcome. Now, how can we fix this? Um, it turns out that we not only have the most likely encoding, but we also have its entire posterior distribution, right? In other words, instead of observing a point, we are actually observing a Q function, Q of Z given X, which corresponds typically to a bell-shaped curve that has a lower variance. And now we can look at its mean and essentially its uncertainty region. And we're mapping now this entire uncertainty region onto the real valued axis. So this gives us some sort of like distorted bell-shaped curve along the interval zero and one. And now, in order to compress that observation, we can pick essentially any number in that uncertainty region that has few decimal places. Right? So this would be the analog to arithmetic coding to lossy compression. Now, the interesting thing here is that this is now ambivalent. Right? Um, there's no well-defined uncertainty interval. Instead, we have an uncertainty distribution in this interval 0 and 1. So which number could we actually choose? Well, first of all, you know, we could choose 0 0.111. Right? So this would give us a number which is actually very close to the actual observed outcome, the most likely outcome, which is that um, cross over there. But this has three decimal places. You know, alternatively, we could pick 0 0.11, which amounts to 3 over 4, which would still be in the uncertainty region, but it would be sort of further away from the most likely encoding. Now, which one is better? Um, turns out that there's a trade-off, right? I mean, there's some ambigu ambiguity here, and that's exactly the rate distortion trade-off that you often, oftentimes encounter in lossy compression. So now you have to make a choice and, um, and, and compress the data point accordingly. <clears throat> now, this was only a one-dimensional example, but uh, you can actually do that in variational autoencoders. Um, the nice thing about um, variational distributions is that they are factorized, so they're kind of breaking down your high dimensional problem into many, many one dimensional problems. So essentially you can kind of determine this rate distortion trade-off independently on every single dimension of your latent space. Okay. So how can we evaluate this model? So we actually showed examples that this is a very reasonable and very efficient compression method, not only for data compression, which we get to later, but also to model compression. In particular, we can actually compress word embedding models. So how do we do that? So what you see here is a plot of um, a performance metric, uh, what's typically applied on um, evaluating word embeddings, namely so-called semantic reasoning tasks. So for example, if you look up the word embedding vector for king, you're subtracting the word embedding vector for man, you're adding women, you ask, you know, what word is actually closest to that resulting vector? 
And the answer is queen in this example, right? If that you know, semantic statement is reflected in your word embedding cloud, then your model is good. And you can essentially measure the hits at 10 um, of, of, of whether um, queen would be, for example, on your top highest scoring answers that your model provides. So now when you kind of naively compress your word embeddings at different um, you know, precisions, and then apply loss, lossless compression on top of that, like um, you know, uh, zip, for example, then you get rate distortion curves that roughly look like this, right? I mean, if you add more bits, then um, you, know, you get a better hit at 10 performance. However, our Bayesian arithmetic coding procedure actually is much, much more efficient than all of these classical baselines. In other words, with fewer bits, we're kind of revealing much more of the compression performance. And, and the reason is that we're essentially also, that we're not allocating bits evenly among the word embeddings, but we're really taking their uncertainties into account. So that gives us much better performance. Now you can do the same thing for image compression. So those are again, typical rate distortion curves. So the Y axis here show you, you know, how many, how compactly do you want to compress your data? How many bits do you allocate to these images? And the vertical axis gives you some <coughs> reconstruction quality measure. Um, so what you see here, the, First of all, Bali et al. indicates the golden standard of neural network-based image compression, um, which is kind of a very uh, good reconstru reconstruction qualities at low bit costs, whereas the dash curve gives you the JPEG um, baseline, um, which is the you know, very popular traditional image compression algorithm that applies to higher resolution images. Um, we also compared against various other forms of quantization, uniform quantization, k-means quantization, and uh, we actually ran more experiments in the meantime. Um, it turns out that you can actually efficiently compress these images with a variable bit rate. Um, you know, given a trained BAE, you apply our compression and post-processing procedure, and you can actually tune the number of bits that you want to spend in that trained model and the you know, accuracy that you're hoping to expect. So ultimately, you get a continuous curve, which is somewhere in the middle between the optimal neural network-based compression um, procedure for models that were explicitly trained towards image compression and um, a very established classical codec, namely um, JPEG, right? So this is actually pretty surprising because the model was not explicitly tuned towards compression. It was just maximizing the amount of information that you could get out of a vanilla variational order encoder. So when you apply this method to actually high resolution images, uh, so this would be um, you know, a high resolution images that we tested on, um, you, you, you fix a certain um, you know, bit rate, for example, a quarter of a bit per pixel, and you play JPEG compression at that bit rate, you would typically get a pretty rasterized image that doesn't show a lot of these granular details of the original image. And if you apply our um, neural compression algorithm at that baseline, you actually get a much smoother, much um, you know, more visually appealing image that also has um, you know, better objective trade-offs in, in terms of rate distortion performance. <clears throat> okay. So, um, I assume I have an hour, is that correct, Asya? Or what is the typical length of these talks? Should I wrap up? Um, sorry, you do. I think it's yeah. fine. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if it's, if it's restricted to shorter period of time usually, but yeah, I think it's fine. Okay, so let me actually try to wrap things up within five minutes. I also promised a third branch uh, of resource efficient learning, which was that about runtime efficiency. And here we really care about how can we actually change these training algorithms? How can we change these um, Bayesian inference algorithms that were incredibly useful for image compression and other tasks? And how can we make them more scalable and, um, and work better in general? So this is about runtime efficiency. <coughs> okay. So first of all, um, again, this is becoming a little bit more technical yet. Um, in variational inference, and um, you know, the, the, the biggest competitor to that method is um, an exact method, which is called Markov chain Monte Carlo sampling. And this is actually a class of algorithms that tries to generate samples from your true Bayesian posterior. Right? So remember the Bayesian posterior, P of Z given X, is given by um, the joint distribution divided by the normalization constant P of Z. And what MCMC algorithms do is they're trying to generate samples Z from that complicated distribution. So this is called Markov chain Monte Carlo. And a particular popular algorithm for scalable MCMC, in particular in Bayesian deep learning, is called Langevin dynamics. And I don't really have time to go too much into details here, but Langevin dynamics essentially amounts to an update procedure very similar to stochastic gradient descent, 
So you're essentially running stochastic gradient descent on your log joint distribution, log p of x comma z, with involving a gradient of z and a learning rate rho. And in addition to that, you're also injecting artificial noise, psi, that you draw from a Gaussian distribution. And crucially, this noise is now scaled uh, proportional to the square root of two times the learning rate times t, right, where t is an artificial temperature. So it turns out that if you're running this Markov chain for a very long time, you're generating a random walk in your parameter space, which is illustrated on the right-hand side. And if that random walk just runs for a very long time and you collect um, sufficiently um, you know, decorrelated samples from that path, you actually get samples from your true Bayesian posterior, which is a very strong statement, very powerful approach. The reason it's mainly slow is that scaling of the learning rate rho, right? So if rho, if your learning rate is small, the square root of rho is actually larger, right? And, and so stability conditions are actually limiting um, the, the learning rate size to be some very small values, right? So you cannot really run this algorithm for very long, gra large gradient steps because otherwise your algorithm would blow up and explode. Right? So you need to run it for a very long time with tiny, tiny gradient steps row. On the other hand, there are these variational inference algorithms that I've already talked a lot about. Um, those are very different in nature, right? They're no longer trying to actually generate samples from a true posterior, but instead they're minimizing these uh, variational objective functions. And, um, and for, that they're, for that reason, they're you know, intrinsically inaccurate, but much faster in general than, than MCMC. Now the question is, can we sort of combine both and can we get the best of both worlds? And could this be potentially even useful for compression? <coughs> okay. So this actually relates to this older work um, that we published a few years back, which is called Stochastic Gradient Descent as Approximate Bayesian Inference. And the simplest way to think about that is um, to essentially really hybridize Langevin dynamics with variational inference as follows. So first of all, you see again the update of Langevin dynamics that I highlighted before. So this is really what you're running your algorithm with, right? You're kind of doing gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent on your loss function. But now there's one crucial difference, and that crucial difference is as follows. First, you consider your learning rate rho and your temperature t as variational parameters that you can freely choose, right? Bayesian theory dictates that temperature should be one, but now we consider temperature t as the free tuning parameter that we can choose however we like, as long as we minimize KL divergence between the resulting sampling distribution and our Bayesian posterior. Right? And second, what we actually did in this paper is we set the temperature t to zero. In other words, we ran the sort of pseudo Langevin dynamics algorithms with no artificial noise. The only noise source of this algorithm was the stochastic gradient noise that is already intrinsic in that stochastic gradient step. Right? And now we only consider it as a, an optimization problem where we tune the optimal learning rate, not for the sake of efficiently converging to a point estimate, but rather to tune the resulting sampling distribution to our Bayesian posterior. And this is actually shown here on the image on the right-hand side, where um, the true posterior is the dashed black curve. So this is an image of parameter space. Um, the cyan dots or the cyan curve and the blue curve, those are the sampling paths of stochastic gradient descent, once with a large learning rate and once with a small learning rate. And ultimately, we want to tune the learning rate such that we get the optimal matching between the resulting stationary distribution and the posterior of interest. OK, so this is kind of faster. Why is it faster? It's essentially faster because we got rid of this artificial noise term. And that essentially allows us to do bigger gradient steps. Right? So we can choose larger rows um, without our algorithm to blow up, to explode. And, um, and, and that really um, also enhances faster convergence and faster mixing in, in this example. <clears throat> okay. So there's actually a recent paper that um, collaborators at Google and, and in collaboration with me um, did and published. It's also accepted at ICML this year, um, which draws an interesting connection to that variational SGD algorithm in some sense, if you think about it. So it turns out that in Bayesian deep learning practice, um, it, it's actually oftentimes found that Langevin dynamics with temperature values which are much smaller than one perform much better in practice. Right? So in other words, the true Bayesian paradigm is somehow broken. You also don't get the best performance if you're simply point estimating your neural network. It turns out the best results are really obtained if you do something in the middle, namely if you run 
uh, Langevin dynamics with a artificially tuned down temperature value between zero and one. Right? Oftentimes very close to zero actually, which would give result in that variational SQV approach. <clears throat> So here, what you see is the test accuracy of a typical Bayesian neural network <coughs> as a function of this artificial temperature. The dashed curve is the um, baseline, you know, just optimizing your neural network. So that would result in a precision value of 0 0.92 in this example. Uh, whereas if you run stochastic gradient MCMC with a smaller temperature, you actually get worse results at high temperatures, but better results at low temperatures, right? So this is actually a mainly experimental paper. It tries to explain that effect from very different angles and, and it arrives at some, some interesting conclusions. Um, I cannot really go much into detail here at this point. <clears throat> so I want to talk about one last innovation of variational inference, which is called iterative amortized variational inference, which is a paper that we also published in ICML two years back. The idea, very crudely speaking, is that um, you can oftentimes get better results if you not only you know, take your um, learned uh, latent code of your inference network for granted uh, in a variational autoencoder, but to actually do some tuning on top of it, right? You're actually running a couple of gradient descent steps on your individual data point to achieve a better latent representation for that single particular data point of interest. So when you actually do that, um, you kind of do some sort of variational EM, EM on top of amortized variational inference, you can actually see that your sample quality and your reconstruction qualities um, uh, improve quite a bit, and also your trained networks improve quite a bit. Um, in, fact, in fact, what we actually did in this paper here, we did something more clever than that. We um, actually amortized again this inference procedure into another neural network such that we actually getting the benefits of EM, whereas um, still having the benefit of fast inference from amortized variational inference. Now, why do I actually mention that as, as kind of my last theoretical contribution here? It turns out there's a very nice recent paper that closes the circle and again draws a, links, a link to image compression. So it turns out that if you use this established method of iterative amortized variational inference and apply it to neural image compression, you can actually really get state-of-the-art image compression performance. Right? So this is actually a recent paper with my student uh, Ibo and uh, my postdoc Robert Bamler. Um, which we just put on archive, and it shows you qualitative um, reconstructions of high resolution images uh, comparing classical, like the Im original image with a, you know, with, um, with a classical uh, compression approach, which is very established and very hard to beat to our approach. And then finally, the state of the art that was published before in the literature, which is MIN in 2018. And I'm actually proud to um, announce that this is actually now the world's best image compression algorithm which really draws on advances in variational inference. So here's a more quantitative approach. We actually run an extensive baseline comparison here against all sorts of different neural network-based image compression approaches. Um, so the vertical line here is the best classical codec, BPG. That is the purple line. And what you see here is the relative savings of bitrate as a function of the PSNR, which is the, um, the quality level um, of, of reconstruction performance that you're targeting. Right? So if you're, um, it's clear that this bit savings could be dependent on the image quality. Uh, but what we see here is that what we propose, which are actually the blue and the orange curve, they're consistently giving you kind of a sort of, you know, 15 to 18 percent performance improvement over the best classical codec, and they're kind of still giving you another whatever seven percent above the most established um, your network-based approach. And, and this is crucial, right? Because if you think about a 7% improvement in, in storage size and you think of internet traffic, um, you know, that this, this, is, um, you know, this is really significant uh, energy savings on, on the go. So anyway, we're optimistic and hopeful that we're getting good uh, reviews. With that, I would like to <laughs> summarize the talk. Um, so I've talked about data efficient Bayesian deep learning and variational inference. Um, so it turns out variational inference, which is this, you know, approximate Bayesian um, machinery um, for, learn, for training large-scale unsupervised models um, provides a path to more resource-efficient deep learning approaches. And we, in particular, discussed different types of resource efficiencies. We talked a lot about data efficiency, which is, you know, learning on sparse, you know, to, you know potentially temporally depending on um, varying observations um, where, where strong priors are necessary and, and in particular Bayesian deep learning makes a huge difference. Uh, we then talked about storage efficiency, which was about most of the time neural data compression models. And we also learned that variational autoencoders are kind of 
currently state-of-the-art approaches um, over both classical and, and neural network-based approaches in this domain, which is a very exciting and recent field. And um, hopefully there's going to be also a workshop um, on this topic soon. And then finally, um, I talked about runtime efficiency, which was essentially about hybridizing exact methods such as Markov chain Monte Carlo with approximate Bayesian methods such as uh, variational, variational inference. So neural network compression and variational inference are very connected and improving inference can lead to better compression performance as we saw in the very last couple of slides. Final remark is I have an open postdoc position, so feel free to apply. Uh, you can find all the details on my website. With that, I would like to thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Asya, for the kind invitation. It was a pleasure to present, and I'm still here for answering a couple of questions. Thank you. <laughs>